Hello, my name is Mary Leger, and I am your liturgist today. Welcome. A word that can be described as a term used to make others feel at ease and accepted. If I am truly welcome, I can feel like I belong. So no matter what you look like, your age, who you love, what you fear, fill in the blanks, you are welcome. I feel welcome when I'm told that it doesn't matter where I am in faith journey, or if I have no faith, I am welcome. Then it's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Welcome. and Shonda was 13. We were walking from my mom's, my mom's job, which was basically originally in Berkshire, here in Oak Park, to Franklin and North Avenue, River Falls. We had made that walk plenty of times before without any issues. Now mind you, my dad's wife worked just a couple blocks into River Falls, and we had been over there a few times before. We were no strangers to the area, and we moved like it. We went to school in River Falls, Played in River Forest. We even walked to the Dominus that used to be right there on North Avenue because it was so close. But this day was different. It felt heavy. I don't know if it was because we looked too comfortable or too happy, but this day had been, uh, this day we had been stopped by the police. The cop who I couldn't picture if I had to stopped and asked us what we were doing. We told him we were on our way home from our mother's job in the park. I guess that answer didn't suffice. The officer had put us in the back of his squad car and one by one questioned us outside the car. Unlike my brothers, I was super emotional and I cried the entire time. I wholeheartedly believe that my obvious fear helped us get out of that situation without any more issues. The officer informed us that we were stopped and questioned because a homeowner had seen us looking into cars and going into yards. The yard that we had allegedly went through uh, just so happened to be right across the street from my dad's wife's job. The officer at the time essentially scolded us. As an adult, I know this now, but it is, uh, it is illegal to question minors without a parent or legal guardian present. But these, these were facts that we didn't know as kids at the time. The officer asked us for our mother's name and number. We found out later he did nothing with that information because my mom had no knowledge of what happened until my crybaby self told her about it when she got home that night. The officer had us waiting for a little longer. It felt like he had just had us on display, almost to make a point or an example out of us. As, uh, as he was letting us go, he advised us not to stop anywhere while we walked home 
which we didn't in the first place. Uh, he told us if we continue to go through yards, um, we would be we would be in more trouble the next time around. See, this all happened between Ashland and Franklin on Greenfield, the River Forest, which is uh, the backside of the elementary school I went to. Uh, once we were released, I'm almost positive that I cried the whole way home, about three blocks, and probably more once I was there. My brothers, on the other hand, were clearly upset. See, at the time, I was still a happy, blissful kid, blind to the injustice of the world, still blind to racism, let alone upper-class upper class suburban racism. From that day forward, I moved differently. My walls got higher, I had a chip on my shoulder. I didn't feel safe uh, or secure anymore. I was living in a home, I was living in my home, but once I left the door, the front door, I was an outsider in my own neighborhood. to now help, uh, help in leading our uh, litany of remembrance and confession. And uh, so we will begin. Let us light a candle to remember those who have been affected by the transatlantic enslavement of African peoples and all who even today are affected by slavery and its legacy. I ask that you join in the litany of remembering and confession as printed in the bulletin. Let us pause to remember those who have been enslaved. We recall that for over 400 years, more than 15 million people were the victims of the tragic transatlantic slave trade. During this time, human beings made in the image of God were bought and sold treated as property, and considered to be less than human. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Allow us to regard all persons as made in your image. Create in us a clean heart, and put a new and bright spirit within us. Let us pause to remember the families that were broken by enslavement. We recall the parents who never saw their children. We recall the family ties that were broken because of forced separation. The tears that were shed, the bitterness caused, and the hurts that continue. Help us, O oh God, to reward others with love and kindness. Create in us a clean heart and put a new and right spirit within us. Let us pause to remember the ways we continue in our world to treat others based on the financial profit we can derive from them. The persons who work in poor conditions and who are underpaid. The children who are forced to work and receive less than minimum wage. The migrant workers who are exploited. Help us, O oh God, to live in right relations with others. Create in us a clean heart and put a new right spirit within us. Slavery still exists today. We remember that women who have been sold into slavery uh, for prostitution. We remember the children who were sold into slavery left vulnerable by poverty. We remember persons who are enslaved because of their addictions. Forgive us, O oh God, when we forget that we are each other's neighbors. Create in us a clean heart and put a new and right spirit
When I read this scripture, my first thought was that I didn't want to proclaim it. None of that even remotely sounds like the God I want to know, the God of love, the God of compassion and healing, the God of forgiveness and second chances, the God who loves us just the way we are no matter what. So I did a little research. It was suggested that when Jesus says, when I say to you, imagine him saying, but the real problem is, if the law said don't murder, then folks felt free to use anger and other violence, or as long as I don't sleep with another person outside my marriage, I'm pretty much okay. Jesus says, but I say to you, or the real problem is that we see each other as objects, as things for our own consumption and use. Adultery may be a symptom, but the deeper issue is that an adulterer has stopped seeing others bad. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable. Leading many of us to wonder, why is this even in the Bible? And more importantly, why on earth would this be chosen as part of our revised common lectionary that our denomination and many others recommend that we reflect on as part of our three-year cycle. So I want to start with a quick reminder that we need to acknowledge that the writer of the Gospel of Matthew did not write this for us. And in fact, I'm guessing that he'd be stunned to know that almost 2,000 years later, we're reading it and working to discern its message for us. And that's not just because he wouldn't have been able to conceptualize a group of people so different from him, sitting in a place that he never knew existed, speaking a language that he had never heard, but because the evangelists and the Matthean community that this was initially addressed to fully expected that Christ, the Messiah, would have returned long before now and we would no longer be living in this in-between time. That is to say that God's vision of that peaceable kingdom would have been fulfilled here on earth. You know the passage, the, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. All of creation harmoniously living in right relationship in a just, peaceful, and sustainable world. But as we kick off this new decade, nearly 2,000 years since the evangelist wrote this gospel, it should be obvious that we are still waiting for the fulfillment of God's vision. And thus we too are living in the in-between time. Like those in the Matthean community, we are imperfect people living in an imperfect world, trying to figure out how best to live out God's call to create a more perfect relationship with all of creation. So to help his community cope with the day-to-day -day challenges of living in this in-between time, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew composed the Sermon on the Mount a collection of sayings and teachings of Jesus, which includes the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and the text that Mary read for us today. And although some of the sayings are from the historical Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount is not a report of a speech actually given on a Galilean hillside. It's the composition of the evangelist. And it was carefully structured to help the community of new Jewish Christian disciples understand that Jesus has the same authority as the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, like Moses, and that there is a deep continuity between Jesus' words and what they have been taught as God's will and the law, 
particularly the Ten Commandments. But as followers of Christ, the Messiah, they are called to do more than just follow the law. They are called to fulfill it. Which is to say, it's not just enough to check the boxes and act in accordance with the law. As Christians, we are called to align our hearts with the intent or root of God's law. Jesus' commands do not replace God's, but rather radicalize them. They go to the radix, or the root of the command, the reason why God gave the law in the first place, and at the root of the law is love. The law of God was meant to foster human flourishing at every level, including the deepest levels of our hearts and minds. God wants us to respect each other, to love each other, to see God's own image residing deep within one another. God cares about our relationships with God's self and with each other, and about how we treat each other because God loves each and all of us so much. Perhaps the way, if you're a parent of multiple children, you care about your relationship with your children, but you care about the relationship the children have with each other because you love them so much. So the writer of Matthew constructs a sermon that is designed to bring this message to his new Christian community and provide guidance for them as they grow in discipleship. The sermon follows a very specific pattern to make it memorable. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And it uses hyperbole to grab their attention and engage them in examining something familiar from a radically different perspective. To see with fresh eyes something they thought they knew, to shake them out of their comfort zone and help them grow. It was never meant to be taken literally. Not 2,000 years ago, not now. Whether it is a call to a deeper level of relationship with each other as part of our maturation as followers of Christ. It is not enough to just refrain from murder. We should also treat each other with respect, and that means not speaking hateful words. It is not enough to avoid physically committing adultery. We should also not objectify other persons by seeing them as a means to satisfy our desires by lusting after them. It is not enough to follow the letter of the law regarding divorce. We should not treat people as disposable and should make sure that the most vulnerable in their culture that often meant women and children are provided for. It's not enough to keep ourselves from swearing falsely or lying to others when we are under oath. We should speak and act truthfully in all of our dealings so that we don't need to make oaths at all. That is to say, God isn't interested in us keeping the law for the law's sake, but rather for our sake. Because when we live in right relationship with each other, we make tangible, significant progress towards creating that just, peaceful, and sustainable world. But of course, following the letter of the law isn't easy, and internalizing it so that not only our behaviors, but our attitudes and emotions align with God's intent presents a whole new level of challenge. Jesus connects the dots for his followers, linking outward acts to internal orientation. It is one thing to behave appropriately, to do acts of service and charity. It's another thing entirely for one's heart to be oriented towards love, all the time, and towards everyone. No easy task. If I'm honest with myself, I'm prone to unconsciously making bargains with God as I go about my daily business trying to be the person that I believe Jesus calls me to be, because I personally find it easier to change my actions than my thoughts, which are a first-line expression of what's in my heart. 
Sometimes this looks like giving money to a stranger in need, but not being willing to take the time to look them in the eye and engage them as a beloved child of God. Because in my heart, I'm a bit afraid, even though I would have difficulty articulating exactly what I'm afraid of other than they're different from me and that makes me uncomfortable. When I was in middle school, it took the form of a willingness to say hurtful things behind someone's back. Things that I knew were mean and I would never say to the person's face, but motivated by a desire to be part of the in crowd, to follow those people that Maureen was mentioning, I rationalized it as okay because the person would never know that I had stabbed them in the back. After all, it wasn't like I was doing bodily harm. Fortunately, as I matured and as a person and in my faith, I abandoned this faulty logic. And although I'm still imperfect, I can attest to the fact that a change of heart did indeed lead to a change in behavior for the better. Our actions are important. And sometimes we have to act our way into changing our hearts. With the point that the writer of Matthew wanted his community and us to understand is that doing one without the other is insufficient. Both are necessary to live in right relationship with others, to create the merciful, peaceful, and just society that we all long for. As children of God and followers of Christ, we are called to live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards us. To respect each other, to love each other, to see God's own image residing deep within one another. Today's text invites us to shift our attention from particular behaviors we would do or avoid and increase our focus on our interior orientations that we must cultivate. What unconscious biases do each of us have that are preventing us from approaching and accepting everyone who cross our path as beloved by God and therefore worthy of our love and respect, regardless of their race, ethnicity, citizenship status, gender definition, economic situation, age, religious belief, or even political affiliation? And what actions might we take as individuals and in community to move closer to being in right relationship with them for their sake and for ours? as we attempt to move this imperfect world one step closer to the peaceable kingdom. We're nearing the end of the church season of Epiphany, during which we have celebrated the living God incarnate among us in the person of Jesus Christ. We proclaim a God that is present in the flesh and bone of our lives, not a keeper of checklists. Born in a manger, God enters the messiness of life in all its dimensions, seeking to heal and to save, shining light into every nook and cranny of our reality. Jesus Christ reorders the relationships and power dynamics of the world and calls us to reorient the internal landscapes of our hearts and minds in a way it is a way of life that demands more and promises more. It is life abundant. And for this we say, thanks be to God. Amen.
In a world where we have, in the past, enslaved and dehumanized others, we go out to treat each person with dignity and respect. In a world where profit is valued more than human life, we go out to proclaim the priceless worth of each person. In a world where the ugliness of racism and white supremacy is found, we go out to show that love conquers all social ills. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.